In John chapter 19, two men are on trial. One man is a thug, a rebel, and a murderer. The other man is holy, righteous, and blameless. And one of these men will die. The sentence is death. The obvious sense is to let the good man go and the bad man dies. And so Pilate cries out to an angry mob, which of the two would you like for me to release? The crowd cries out, Barabbas! Pilate says, well, what do you want me to do with this Jesus who is called the Christ? And they cry out, crucify him. Pilate says, why? What evil has he done? Crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. They cry out all the more. When Pilate realizes that, that he's gaining nothing and that a riot is about to ensue, he washes his hands of the matter and said, this man's blood be on your shoulders. I'm innocent of this man's blood. As wicked, as vile, and as godless as he was, Pilate had no desire to kill Jesus. He didn't want to do it. Pilate knew that Jesus was innocent. His wife was in his ear telling him, this man is innocent, this man is righteous, this man has done nothing wrong. I've been having dreams. Don't do it. Pilate's conscience was in his ear. Don't do it, Pilate. This man has done nothing wrong. He's righteous. He's blameless. He's innocent. Don't kill this man. Pilate had no desire to kill Jesus. And so he has a plan. He has a plan to show this angry mob that there is no way in the world that this Jesus is truly the Christ. His plan is to show this angry mob there's no way in the world that this Jesus is truly the Son of God. There's no way in the world that this Jesus, this man, is truly the King of kings and the Lord of lords. There's no way in the world that this could be true. So he has him scourged. Jesus is stripped bare. His hands are tied to a pole. His knees are bent, his back is turned, and he's struck again and again and again and again until his bloody, beaten, and berated back doesn't even look human. But to make things worse, to make things worse, the Roman soldiers come in and, 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 they, and they have this, this purple robe and, and they're saying him, all hail King of the Jews. They twist together this crown of thorns and shove it through his scalp. Blood is pouring down from his face. They put a reed in his hand. They, they, they mock him. Oh, oh, you're the king of the Jews. You're the king of the Jews. They take the reed out of his hand and they strike him in the face, blow after blow after blow after blow, until his appearance is so marred. His appearance is so marred that he didn't even look human. They strike him in the face, blow after blow after blow after blow, until his appearance is so marred that men turn their faces from him. And so, in John chapter 19, in verse number 4, the Bible says, Pilate went out again and said to them, See, I am bringing him out to you that you may know that I find no guilt in him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Behold the man. Look at him. He's pitiful. He's awful. He's bruised. He's beaten. There's no way in the world that this man is Jesus Christ. Let him go. Pilate figured if they could see Jesus as man, they'd have sympathy on him and let him go. And so the question that I ask you this morning is, was Pilate right? Was Jesus truly a man? If we're honest with ourselves, and if we're honest with the Scriptures, we'll realize that Pilate was partially correct. Pilate was wrong in his estimation of Jesus as Lord, 
but he was right in his estimation as Jesus, as man. Jesus was man. In his prologue in John chapter 1, as, as John is introducing Jesus to the world, he says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning, and all things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that has been made. There, there, John paints the picture that Christ was God. He was God. He was in the beginning with God. He created the heavens and the earth. Nothing was made in this world that wasn't created by Christ. Yes, He was God. But John drops down in verse 14 and says, The Word, Christ, became what? Flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen or we have beheld His glory as a Son of from the Father, full of grace and truth. We have seen His glory. We have seen Him in the flesh and blood. He had hands, He had feet, He had eyes, He had skin. He was man. Philippians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul says much the same. Christ even though he was in the form of God, even though he was God, he didn't count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself, taking the form of a servant. And when he came in the likeness of men, he appeared in human form, and he was obedient to his Father, even to the point of death. And so was Pilate right. Was Jesus man? Yes, Jesus was man. And so this morning, I just want to introduce you to the humanity of Jesus. I want to show you Jesus, the man. Christ came to this earth with the same physical weaknesses and the same emotional challenges that we experience today because he was human. In Luke chapter 4, In Luke chapter 4, just before he begins his earthly ministry, he's been led by the Spirit into the wilderness, and he has been fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, and the passage says that he was hungry. Our Lord experienced hunger. In Matthew chapter 21, just before he curses the fig tree, the text says that Jesus was hungry. In John chapter 19, just before he's about to pour out his blood for the sins of the world, The text says that Christ cried out, I thirst. I thirst. I'm thirsty. I'm parched. Give me something to drink. Why? Because I have physical weaknesses. And I have physical weaknesses because I'm a man. Our Lord experienced fatigue. Time and time and time again throughout Scripture, after Jesus and his apostles have been spending hours upon hours teaching and preaching and doing all kinds of mighty works, they withdraw to desolate places to be alone so that they can have some rest. In Mark chapter 6, just after, or just before, excuse me, Jesus feeds 5,000 men with five loaves of bread and two fish, he tells his disciples, to go away and rest for a while. Why? Because there were men who were tired. Our Lord experienced fatigue. In Mark chapter 4, when Jesus and his disciples are on that boat, and the winds and the waves are rocking and rolling, and the Lord is sound asleep on that boat, why was Jesus asleep? Was he asleep to prove a point to his disciples that he could sleep through a storm? No! Our Lord nor His disciples ever performed miracles for their own good. In Mark chapter 4, when Jesus was asleep in that boat, He was asleep because He was so tired from the day before and from the work that He was doing that He fell asleep through a storm. That's why He was asleep. Because He was a man who experienced physical weaknesses. In John chapter 4, just before Jesus has that conversation with the woman of Samaria, the text says that he sat down by the well because he was wearied from his journey. Do you see it, ladies and gentlemen? Our Lord was a man who experienced physical weaknesses. But not only that, Jesus was a man of emotion. Christ was a man of emotion. 
It's hard to picture Jesus as a man who wasn't always so calm, cool, and collected. But he wasn't always calm, cool, and collected. He was a man who experienced anger. In Matthew chapter 23, in Matthew chapter 23, as Jesus is pronouncing his woes upon the scribes and the Pharisees and the Jewish religious leaders, he calls them a brood of vipers. He calls them whitewashed tombs full of dead men's bones. He was angry. He was upset with them at their hypocrisy. Christ was a man who experienced righteous indignation. In John chapter 2, as he enters into the temple and he sees that the Jewish religious leaders have turned the house of God into, into a place of merchandise, the text says that he flips over the tables, he pours out the money, and he makes a whip, and he drives the people out. Our Lord was angry. He was upset. He was a man of emotion. He was a man who experienced compassion. All throughout Scripture, we see the compassionate nature of Jesus. In Mark chapter 1, a leper approaches him. A leper approaches him, and he's crying out to the Lord, Lord, please cleanse me. Please heal me. And the passage says when Jesus looked at this man, he had pity on him. Mark chapter 6, just before Jesus feeds the 5,000. He sees them as sheep without a shepherd, and the text says that he had compassion for them. In Mark chapter 8, just before he feeds the 4,000, he looks at them, and he has compassion for them. In Luke chapter 7, as Jesus and his apostles are entering into the city of Nain, a dead man is being carried out. People are weeping and wailing and lamenting, and this man was the only son of his mother who was a widow, and when Jesus saw this dead man's mother, the text says that he had pity for her. He had compassion for her. Jesus was Lord who came to this earth as a man who had emotions. He was a man who experienced anger. He was a man who had compassion. And he was a man of sorrows. He was a man of sorrows. The prophet Isaiah told us many, many, many years ago that our Lord would come to this earth as a man of sorrows who is very, very familiar and very, very acquainted with grief. All throughout his life, he experienced pain, he experienced sadness, and he experienced sorrow because he was a man. In John chapter 11, as he is entering into the city of Bethany, the sisters of Lazarus, Mary and Martha are weeping and they're crying out and they're mourning because their brother Lazarus is dead. But not only are Mary and Martha grieving and mourning and lamenting over their dead brother, multitudes of Jews are pouring out their hearts, crying out, Jesus, if you had simply been here, Lazarus wouldn't have died. And the passage says that when Jesus sees all of this commotion, when he sees all of this pain, when he sees all of this sadness, his spirit groaned within him. His spirit groaned within him. He was sorrowful. He asked, where have they laid him? Where's the body? They take Jesus to the body. And the shortest verse in Scripture says that Jesus wept. And as he's weeping, as he's crying, as he's pouring out his heart to God... Everyone there says, see how he loved him. This Jesus, this man, is so upset. He's grieving so much that he must have loved this man, Lazarus, a whole lot. He's so sad. He's so sorrowful. He's so full of emotion that he must have loved this man oh so much. In his final hours, before he is about to be led like a lamb to the slaughter. He and his disciples are entering into the Garden of Gethsemane. And Jesus says to his disciples, My soul is sorrowful even to the point of death. What does that mean? My soul is sorrowful even to the point of death. That means I'm hurting so bad. I'm so sorrowful. I'm so upset. I'm experiencing so much emotion that I feel like I could die. 
My soul is sorrowful to the point of death. And Luke tells us that he, he falls down on his knees. He's pouring out his heart to God. Lord, please! Please, if there's any other way, this is so hard, this is going to be so tough, if there's any other way, please, please let this cup pass from me. The passage says, as Jesus is praying, he sweats blood. He's so full of emotion that he's sweating great drops of blood. And the text says that an angel of the Lord came and was strengthening him. Why would an angel of the Lord come and strengthen our Lord? An angel of the Lord came and strengthened our Lord because he was a man who experienced physical and emotional weaknesses. And so we get to the point in our discussion where we ask ourselves, what is the point? Why are we spending all of this time this morning talking about the humanity of Jesus? What in the world does this have to do with me? This has everything to do with me because Jesus was a man as we are man. Jesus was human as we are human. I am human. I am a man who has sadness. I am a man who has sorrows. I am a man who has grief. I am a man who gets angry. I am a man who gets upset. I am a man who has physical and emotional weaknesses. And we can take comfort in knowing that our Lord Jesus Christ was, was a man just as we are. He was a human just as we are. Yet, in spite of all of the physical and all of the emotional weaknesses that men and women experience on this side of heaven, He stayed faithful to His God. He remained faithful to the Lord of all creation. In Philippians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul says, even though Christ was in the form of God, He didn't count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but He emptied Himself, taking the form of a man, and when He came to this earth in the likeness of men, He was what? Obedient. He was obedient. He was faithful to His Father God, even to the point of death. He endured it all. Despite being man, He was faithful to God. The Hebrew writer says much the same in Hebrews chapter 5. In the days of His flesh, when Christ was man, He offered up prayers and supplications to God the Father with loud cries and tears. And He was heard. Why? Because of His reverence. And even though he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And having been made perfect, he is the source of eternal life and salvation for all who believe. Christ is God who came to this earth as man, who had the same physical and the same emotional challenges that we experience today, but through it all, he remained faithful and he remained obedient to his God. And so as men and women on this side of heaven, when it feels like the weight of the world is on our shoulders, when it feels like we just want to give up, quit, and throw in the towel, remember that we do not serve a God. We do not serve a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. We serve a God who can sympathize with our weaknesses, and he has been tempted at all points as we have been tempted but he hasn't sinned. He's remained faithful to his God. And so, when life gets hard, let's continue running this race with endurance, looking to Jesus, who is the author and the perfecter of our faith. And so again, we ask ourselves the question, was Pilate right? Pilate said, no, there's no way that Jesus could be, could be God, but I don't want to kill him because he's innocent. He hasn't done anything wrong. He's a simple man. Was Pilate right? He was, he was partially right. He was wrong in his estimation of Jesus as Lord, but he was right in his estimation of Jesus as man. Christ came to this earth, and he lived as a man, he suffered as a man. He died as a man. But he was raised as king of kings 
and Lord of Lords. Let's pray. O oh Lord our God, how excellent is your name in all of the earth. You are the most wonderful counselor. You are the mighty God. You are the everlasting Father, and we praise you for that. We thank you so much for your eternal plan that sent your son to this earth down from 42 generations to become a man of sorrows, a man who was acquainted with grief, and a man who died for us. But we thank you so much for that resurrection and what it means to us. We pray that we will all be people who look to Jesus every single day of our lives and try to emulate his life and his character into everything that we do, ultimately for your glory. We thank you so much for all that you do for us, and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're here this morning and you are not a Christian, this is the perfect opportunity to become one. There are many, many people here this morning who uh, would like to encourage you and help you along your way. Uh, and we would love to help you with that by um, having you uh, come down front and, and confess the name of Jesus and, and repent of your sins and have your sins totally washed away in, within the watery grave of baptism. If you've done that before, but you've uh, fallen away, you've uh, ran from God as, as Jonah did, as we've talked about this weekend, if you've made mistakes, but you would like to make things right today, we can help you this morning while we stand and sing the song of invitation.